Cardinal Henry Newman once wrote, When an idea is of a nature to arrest and possess the mind, it may be said to have life. At first, men will not fully realise what it is that moves them, and will express and explain themselves inadequately. There will be a time of confusion when conceptions and misconceptions are in conflict. It will be interrogated and criticised by enemies, and defended by well-wishers. It will, in proportion to its native vigour and subtlety, introduce itself into the framework and details of social life, strengthening or undermining the foundations of established order. In a word, when an idea gets criticised and challenged, when it goes to war, it is either defeated in the minds of men, or it is brought out all the more into greater clarity and relief. Cardinal Newman's words are pertinent because this study is about sedivacantism, but by extension it is about Catholicism, and namely it raises the question of what Catholicism is as opposed to what it is not. Cardinal Newman wrote generally on how Catholic doctrines, although always true and always known, would not need to make themselves explicit unless the war of denial and confusion was waged. Now we speak to a basic doctrine, the Church's very identity, and the war that is being waged upon it. Hence, you have the spirit of these videos that will attempt to clarify the Sedivacantis position. They seek to explain Sedivacantism and the arguments that support it, because there is a great deal of misunderstanding and misnomers clouding around it. The hope is to dispel some of this confusion, and in the process add some clarity about what Catholicism is and what it is based upon. To do this, our study will proceed through a number of stages. We will begin by asking, what is Sedivacantism? And find that it is a theological position, as distinct from a movement, which posits two churches, the true Catholic Church and an illegitimate one which has broken away from it. After this question has been answered, we will ask whether sedivacantism is an argument that can be made in principle. We will do this by first considering the foundational Catholic principles that sedivacantism is based upon, namely that Catholic doctrine is unified, it is consistent, it is infallible, and it is to be found in the Church's magisterium. Second, we shall consider the arguments against the very possibility of sedivacantism. We will consider whether it is based upon private judgement, whether it entails that the church is invisible, and whether it entails that the church has defected. After this, we will look at the particular proofs for sedivacantism by comparing the details of traditional church doctrine found in her magisterium to the magisterial teachings that follow the Second Vatican Council. It is worth mentioning at this point that many studies of sedivacantism focus on the heresy and pertinacity of individuals. This is not something that this current study will do. Instead, its focus will be placed on church doctrine as a whole, and whether one and the same church can teach two different and incompatible things. In all, a case will be made for sedivacantism and its relation to, or should we say, as a continuation of eternal Catholicism. It is understood from the outset that much will be left unsaid and many questions left unanswered, such that this study will not be satisfactory for all people. But with this in mind, it is worth reflecting upon the words of Saint Bernadette. My job is to inform, not to convince. And so, the hope is that these videos will inform at least some of those who seek to learn. What is Sedivacantism? Sedivacantism is the theological position that the papal chair is vacant and that there is no legitimate pope currently occupying the Holy See. This applies at least to the current occupant, but in many, if not most cases, this is extended to all apparent popes since the Second Vatican Council. It is this form of sedivacantism that we will be exploring. By extension, sedivacantists do not only reject those who they regard as false papal claimants, 
but the church and hierarchy that they have presided over, because it follows that if these popes were illegitimate, either a. all those who recognise these false popes and their authorities constitute a false church, or b. a false church has existed and therefore has been presided over by false authorities. Hence, we come to the first great misnomer about Sedi Vacantism, that, like Protestantism or the Eastern Schism, it is somehow a rejection of the Catholic Church and an attempt to break away from it. Yet, whereas Protestantism and the Eastern Schism did break away from Catholicism and became something quite different, those who hold the Sedi Vacantis position and the traditional Catholic faith represent a continuation of that same Catholic Church and that same Catholic faith that has always been. Indeed, the claim is that, however unlikely or audacious it may seem, it is the Church that Sedi Vacantis reject which should be likened to Protestantism, because it represents a clear and distinct break in morals, practice and teaching from the Catholic Church that came before it. This church is called the Novus Ordo, or Concilia Church, and this is the organisation that most people today would recognise as the Catholic Church, a position that Sedi Vacantism rejects. Is this a rejection of the papacy? It may appear to be, but Sedivacantists do not believe that they are rejecting a pope, nor the office of the papacy. Indeed, they believe that they are rejecting a non-pope. This is very important to emphasise, because, on the one hand, rejecting a legitimate pope is an affront to Catholicism, whereas on the other hand, rejecting a false pope is nothing less than a Catholic duty. Therefore, to claim that Sedi Vacantism is false on the grounds that it rejects the papacy is a foregone conclusion that begs the question. The real question is, do Sedi Vacantists reject a legitimate pope and their church? Only once this question is answered can the matter be settled. In principle, Sedi Vacantism is not a rejection of the doctrines of papal primacy or papal infallibility. And indeed, Sedi Vacantis draw upon the teaching authority of Catholic popes as proof of their position. Is it a movement? As we have stated, Sedi Vacantism is a theological position. That is, it is an idea. Therefore, Sedi Vacantism is not a movement. It is not the title for any particular organisation or group. There are groups that organise themselves on the grounds of their Sedi Vacantism, but the status, and most importantly, the truth value of Sedi Vacantism is something distinct. It is something that runs parallel to the groups that adhere to it, but is not dictated by them. This is also why disagreement amongst individual Sedi Vacantists does not constitute a challenge to Sedi Vacantism as a position. As a comparison, two men might agree that God exists, but disagree that he is a triune God. Yet, the fact that there is a disagreement between the two men has no effect on the truth value of either of the doctrines. In this case, both doctrines are true. Both men are right about the first doctrine, and one is wrong about the second. But most importantly, we would not say that both men are somehow wrong about the existence of God, simply because they disagree about the Trinity. The same logic applies to Sedi Vacantism. As a theological position which is distinct from any particular individual, its truth value is not dependent upon complete agreement on all matters of doctrine between all those who accept it. That is also why there is no specific group or spokesperson who speaks on behalf of all Sedi Vacantists. Therefore, you might ask, 
if Catholicism must have an authority that speaks on its behalf, can Sedivacantists be regarded as Catholic? Let's look at this more broadly. Is Sedivacantism Catholic? If Sedivacantism is true, accepting it would be a requirement for holding the true Catholic faith. However, the acceptance of Sedivacantism alone is not the measure of Catholicism. The logic is as follows. If Sedivacantism is true, anyone who does not accept it does not hold the true Catholic faith, because they recognise an illegitimate claimant to the papacy, an illegitimate hierarchy, and, by extension, a false church. If Sedivacantism is true, anyone who does accept it, and holds true to the consistent traditional teaching of the church, can be said to hold the true Catholic faith, because they reject a false church and remain faithful in their commitment to the true church, whilst retaining the unity of faith. However, this also means that if Sedivacantism is true, accepting it is not its own guarantee of Catholicism. If, for example, an individual professed themselves to be a Catholic and accepted the Sedivacantist position, but also professed a belief in Thor or the worship of satanic idols, that person would still have made a break from the Catholic faith. Hence, we can return to the question. If Catholicism must have an authority that speaks on its behalf, can Sedivacantists be regarded as Catholic? The answer is yes, because although Sedivacantists have no authority who speaks for them as Sedivacantists, if they are Catholics, they do have an authority that speaks for them as Catholics. That authority is the infallible magisterium of the Church, the consistent teaching of the Church, which has been passed down and codified in canon law, catechisms, councils, papal encyclicals, and other sources including the writings and practice of the sacred liturgy. In a word, Catholics can appeal to and base their beliefs upon what the Church has always taught. This infallible teaching, which is not distinct from, but intimately interwoven with the proper authorities, be they popes or bishops, is the expression of her dogmatic authority. And Sedivacantis conclude that this same authority teaches them to reject the current claimants to the Holy See. And so, we've covered what Sedivacantism is. To go further, we should, of course, consider the evidence and arguments made for the position. However, we must do something else first. Many might protest that Sedivacantism cannot be entertained, let alone proven, because it is a conclusion that cannot even be reached in principle, and therefore must be rejected as false ipso facto. This is another misnomer, but it is important to address. And so, before we consider the specific proofs for Sedivacantism, we shall consider the basic principles that it is based upon, and, by extension, some basic principles of Catholic thought. Before we consider the proofs of Sedivacantism, let us begin by considering the matter in principle. We can do this in two respects. In the first respect, we can consider what the principles of Catholic thought are, and what principles Sedivacantists appeal to when developing their argument. Namely, principles of consistency and infallibility in reference to the Church's magisterium. In the second respect, we can consider whether Sedivacantism fails in principle. The charge to be addressed is that Sedivacantism cannot be true on principle because it is rejected by the Church, makes an appeal to private authority, and would render the Church invisible as well as defective. For this first part of our discussion on principle, let's consider the positive principles upon which the Sedivacantis case is built. 
This part of the argument develops like so. A. Catholics are unified in faith. B. Catholic doctrine is consistent. C. The Catholic Church teaches infallibly on faith and morals. D. This infallible teaching is reflected through the Church's magisterium. E. Therefore, the Church cannot contradict its own magisterial teaching. Any Church that does so is not the Catholic Church. And so, let's unpack that. Firstly, Catholics are unified in faith. This is one of the four marks of the Church, a distinguishing feature of Catholicism. As Pope Pius IX wrote, No other Church is Catholic except the one which grows into one body in the unity of faith. As Father Sylvester Berry wrote in his treatise on the Church, the Church must have unity of doctrine taught and accepted, or unity of faith. And according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, for a man to be a member of the Church, he must profess the true faith. Individual Catholics may err and disagree about all sorts of issues, but the Church herself remains unified in its faith. When the Church has defined something as true, it is incumbent upon Catholics to bend to that truth. This is because the Church is nothing less than the teaching authority of God's truth, and for all people, that is one and the same truth. This is the first key principle that we must consider. The second principle is that Catholic doctrine is consistent. This is very important because, simply put, the truth is consistent. Even if we leave matters of religion and Catholicism aside, it is a strict axiom of logic that truth must be consistent and that contradictions cannot be true. Hence, claims like 2 plus 2 equals 5, or all circles are squares, or God is not God, are false, but not only false, they are strict nonsense. Catholicism is a rational faith, not by accident, but by necessity, because only a faith that is rational and consistent can, in fact, be true. The next key principle is that Catholic doctrine is infallible. Now, it is not the case that everything said by a member of the clergy or even the Pope is to be taken as infallible, and if a teaching is not infallible, contradicting it does not present a problem. However, the Church does teach infallibly through her magisterium, which is the Church's divinely appointed authority to teach the truths of religion. The magisterium comes in two kinds, ordinary and extraordinary. The extraordinary or solemn magisterium is comprised of formal, official pronouncements. Whenever a pope speaks ex cathedra, or a council defines a given doctrine to be believed by all of the faithful, we see the formation of the solemn magisterium in action. The ordinary magisterium is the other form of church teaching, continually exercised by the Church, especially in her universal practices connected with faith and morals, in the unanimous consent of the Fathers and theologians, in the decisions of the Roman congregations concerning faith and morals, in the common sense of the faithful and various historical documents in which the faith is declared. That is to say, a particular bishop or theologian or papal encyclical may not be infallible, but when the Church has consistently exercised the same faith, and when popes and bishops and saints and theologians have consistently taught the same doctrines about faith and morals, those doctrines are to be regarded as infallible, even if they have not been officially defined. We are told as much by the First Vatican Council when it states that all those things are to be believed by divine and Catholic faith which are contained in the written word of God or in tradition and which are proposed by the Church either in solemn judgment or its ordinary and universal teaching office as divinely revealed truths which must be believed. Hence, we find the magisterium codified in many different documents, such as papal bulls and encyclicals, in catechisms, and in the documents of ecumenical councils. 
because, quote, that an ecumenical council is an organ of infallibility cannot be denied. We also find the magisterium expressed through canon law, because, quote, the ultimate source of canon law is God. Hence, in the magisterium of the church, we see a body of doctrines which are infallible as a direct result of the church's teaching and governmental authority in its supernatural mission, given by God and protected by the spirit of truth to teach all of mankind the true faith. Therefore, the church cannot contradict these teachings, any of them. To do so would be to forego its mission, to deny its own infallibility, to fly in the face of reason and to trivialise the promise made by God. Therefore, either the church remains true to its magisterium, or it is not the church. Therefore, this is what the Sedi Vacantis position is built upon. Appealing to the magisterium is not an appeal to something other than official ecclesiastical authority, because the magisterium is a direct expression of it. And if the Novus Ordo Church purports to be Catholic, its magisterium is formed in the same way and is just as binding. The Novus Ordo must be consistent with the Catholic magisterium. If it is not, it cannot be the Catholic Church. Now that we have looked at the positive principles for Sedivacantism, let's consider the case that Sedivacantism is a conclusion that cannot be reached in principle. This case is made in a number of different ways. Namely, the claim is that Sedivacantism cannot possibly be true, because a. the Church has rejected it, i.e. the Novus Ordo Church, b. Sedivacantism is based on an appeal to private authority or judgment, c. If Sedivacantism is true, it would render the Church invisible, or d. If Sedivacantism is true, it would mean that the Church has defected. Let's examine each one of these claims in turn. Firstly, the claim that Sedivacantism is false because the Novus Ordo has rejected it should be a clear non-starter. It is a circular argument that begs the question. Sedivacantists claim that the Novus Ordo Church is illegitimate. Yet the logic of this argument is this. The church that Sedivacantism rejects, the Novus Ordo, is the true church. The true church must be right. The Novus Ordo Church has rejected Sedivacantism. Therefore, Sedivacantism must be false. And therefore, the church that Sedivacantism rejects, the Novus Ordo, must be the true church. See the difficulty? This relies upon the assumption that the Novus Ordo Church is the true church, but this is the very assumption that Sedivacantism challenges. And so, to accept this argument, or any variation of it, does not deal with Sedivacantism, but ignores it, with the conclusion that Sedivacantism is wrong because it is wrong. The question remains, but is it? Now let's consider the charge of private judgment. Sedivacantists have concluded that the Novus Ordo Church as a whole, including the people within it, have displayed anti-Catholic teaching and practices and are therefore not legitimate. The claim is that Sedivacantists have no right to do this because, as most Sedivacantists are laity, they have no authority to say when someone has transgressed against church teaching or defected from the faith nor do they have the authority to remove someone's clerical office. The key point to make is that they don't. If a cleric has defected from the faith or does not hold the Catholic faith, no layman uses their own private judgment as if their own judgment is what finally removes the authority. The law removes their authority and does this automatically. That individuals who do not profess the true Catholic faith are barred from positions of authority is an automatic consequence of church law and Catholic principle. The Magisterium states as much. According to canon law, any office becomes vacant upon the fact and without any declaration by tacit resignation 
recognized by the law itself if a cleric publicly defects from the Catholic faith. And we see this in many other teachings. Therefore, in the case of Sedi Vacantism, a layman does not decide to remove authority, but simply recognizes when authority has been lost, or indeed was never held in the first place. One might continue to protest that a Sedi Vacantist cannot determine when a man is a heretic because we cannot see a man's will and intentions, i.e., we cannot judge the internal forum. This is irrelevant because Sedivacantists recognize manifest heresy, that is, when purported Catholics publicly and visibly teach or act in ways which are contrary to the faith. Finally, one might claim that we cannot say for sure if something has publicly, visibly transgressed the faith. This claim is simply absurd. To hold it would be to posit that the Catholic faith is so subtle, so opaque, and dare we say so occult that the average Catholic cannot tell what it really is, and hence, whether it has been upheld. Yet, what sense is there in teaching the Catholic faith unless the Church expects the faithful to be able to recognise what is Catholic and what is not? The Church authorities are the arbiters of the faith, and it is through the Church that revelation is interpreted. But it is not as if the Church is so stratified that only clerics and clergy can perceive what the faith is, whilst the laity are blind to it. Hence, the charge that sedivacantism relies on private judgment is false. If sedivacantism is true, it is not true by virtue of the private judgment of individuals. It is true as a matter of Catholic faith, and magisterial law. Now we can consider the claim that if sedivacantism is true, it would render the church invisible. This claim is based on the fact that if sedivacantism is true, the Catholic church has far fewer members than most people believe, and may even lack a clergy. Both of these justifications are false. To begin with, there are many Sedivacantist clergy who have valid orders and who are able to administer the sacraments. The Lux Vera directory contains a general global list of such clergy, but there are even international organisations such as the CMRI or the IMBC that can be mentioned. The existence of such organisations is also proof that the Church is not invisible. That the Church must be visible is one of its four marks or defining characteristics, but according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Church is materially visible when, quote, it is a society which is public and manifest to the world, not a body whose members are bound by some secret tie. All that is required for the Church to be visible is that its members make themselves known as Catholics and are not hidden away as part of some occult club. Hence, the fact that there are Sedivacantis clergy and that Sedivacantis laity make themselves known as practicing Catholics means that, if Sedivacantism is true, the Church remains visible, even if its members are few in number. Finally, we come to the charge that Sedivacantism cannot be true, because if it were true, this would mean that the Church has defected because it no longer has a hierarchy and cannot have another successor to St. Peter. This is not so. Firstly, as we have seen, the Church retains legitimate clergy. Secondly, the methods of papal election are subject to change and have changed throughout history. The use of cardinals is long-standing, but not necessary, and indeed, the Catholic Encyclopedia states, should the College of Cardinals ever become extinct, the duty of choosing a supreme pastor would fall not on the bishops assembled in council, but upon the remaining Roman clergy. Thus, we see that if sedivacantism is true, the Church retains the power to elect a new pope. Finally, Christ's promise that St. Peter would always have a successor is not broken by an interregnum, or gap between papacies. Indeed, such a gap occurs each time a pope dies. 
One might claim that if Sedivacantism is true, the interregnum is simply too long. But the challenge is returned. Where in the Magisterium does it state how long an interregnum can be before it is too long? It doesn't. And the Church still retains the power to elect a new Pope. And so a new successor to St. Peter can still be named. Therefore, we see that the Sedivacantis case can be made in principle. If Sedivacantism is true, it would not mean that Sedivacantism is fallaciously based upon private judgment, nor would it mean that the Church is invisible, nor would it mean that the Church has defected. Now that we have addressed Sedivacantism on matters of principle, we can proceed to examine the case on grounds of proof. Now that we have considered some of the principles upon which Sedivacantism is based, we can consider whether there is any legitimate proof for it. As we have established, Sedivacantism can be proven by a clear break in doctrine between what the Catholic Church has always taught and what has been taught by the apparent Church or Novus Ordo Church since the Second Vatican Council. If there is a clear break in doctrine, this would either mean that the Catholic Church has contradicted her own teaching, renounced her infallibility and defected, which it cannot do, or it would mean that the Church that promulgates the new, inconsistent teaching is simply not the Catholic Church. As such, the hierarchy of this second church would not be Catholic, whether or not its clergy are called priests, bishops, or popes. This can be proven in at least two ways. The first is in reference to the church's teaching about other religions, and the second is in reference to the church's teaching about prayer and sacraments for non-Catholics. As we shall see in this case, these two issues have significant overlap. Let's begin with the Church's teaching on other religions, and let's begin by outlining the traditional, infallible, magisterial teaching of the Catholic Church. We start with the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which states that, amongst those who break the first commandment are those who fall into heresy, who believe not what Holy Mother Church propounds to be believed. And so, those who reject Catholic doctrine, i.e. other religions, break the first commandment. In the Catholic Encyclopedia, we read, The third mark of the Church is that she is Catholic, that is, universal, and justly is she called Catholic. According to Pope Pelagius II, If anyone, however, either suggests, or believes, or presumes to teach contrary to this faith, let him know that he is condemned and also anathematized. According to Pope Gregory XVI, true worship of God is unique to the Catholic religion. According to Pope St. Gregory the Great, the Holy Universal Church teaches that it is not possible to worship God truly except in her. According to Pope Innocent III, speaking ex cathedra, the universal church of the faithful is one outside of which no one is saved. According to Pope Clement VI, the Roman church alone is Catholic. And finally, according to Pope Pius XI, that false opinion which considers all religions to be more or less good and praiseworthy, not only are those who hold this opinion in error and deceived, but also, in distorting the idea of true religion, they reject it. And so, as you can see in the consistent, infallible, magisterial teaching of the Church, we get this idea that the Roman Catholic religion is uniquely true and universal, that true worship of God can only take place in Catholicism, and that doctrines and religions that are contrary to her are to be condemned. Now we can go further. If we consider Islam specifically, the Catholic Church has taught the following. According to Pope Eugene IV, there is hope that every man from the abominable sect of Muhammad 
will be converted to the Catholic faith. Hence, Islam has been called abominable. According to Pope Calixtus III, I vow to exalt the true faith and to extirpate the diabolical sect of the reprobates and faithless Muhammad in the East. And so, Islam has been called diabolical. And the Catholic Encyclopedia states, What is really good in Mohammedan ethics, i.e. Islam, is either commonplace or borrowed from some other religions, whereas what is characteristic is nearly always imperfect or wicked. That is to say, what is distinctly and characteristically Islamic is nearly always imperfect or wicked. Hence, the Magisterium teaches that other religions are to be condemned and that Islam is abominable, diabolical and wicked. In general, we receive the teaching that other religions are not to be esteemed. This is distinct from the respect and charity we owe individual believers who Catholics should want to save from false religions. Now we can compare this to the magisterial teaching of the Novus Ordo Church. In the Second Vatican Council documents we read, The Church also looks upon Muslims with respect. They worship the one God, living and subsistent, merciful and almighty, creator of heaven and earth. They have regard for the moral life and worship God in prayer, almsgiving and fasting. This does not refer to individual Muslims who are held within the bonds of a diabolical sect, but gives general praise to Islam as a religion, Muslim worship and Muslim morals. Not to mention that it equates the one God, creator of heaven and earth, with Allah, which is impossible because Allah does not include Christ, through whom the world was created. Hence, this is a direct denial of the Holy Trinity. In another Second Vatican Council document, we read, But the plan of salvation also embraces those who acknowledge the Creator, and among these the Muslim are first. They profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and along with us they worship the one merciful God who will judge mankind on the last day. Hence, Islam is praised as a means to salvation, as is Muslim worship. And once again, the Trinity is denied because God is named as the judge of mankind. But Catholics are told in the creed that Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead. Allah does not include the divinity of Christ. Documents of an ecumenical council hold magisterial weight. After all, that an ecumenical council is an organ of infallibility will not be denied by anyone. Yet, if this does not suffice, consider the actions and teachings of Novus Ordo Popes. Benedict XVI stated, I frequently expressed the respect of the Catholic Church for Islam. He also received a Quran and said, The Quran, for which I have the respect due to the holy book of a great religion. John Paul II was pictured kissing the Quran, a clear sign of respect to it as a religious text. And Francis gave respect to Islamic festivals, saying, I convey sincere best wishes for a fruitful month of Ramadan and a joyous Id al-Fatir. Speaking of non-Catholic churches in general, Cardinal Ratzinger said, Therefore, the Church of Christ is present and operative also in these churches. Also, Muslim worship has since been welcomed into Catholic churches, whether that be Muslim ritual dance, general Muslim prayer alongside Catholics, or even the Muslim call to prayer voiced in a Catholic church with consent of the priest, as seen here. In sum, we do not have a lone case of esteem, but we see respect given to Islam as a religion in council documents, in the example and teaching of multiple popes, and in the welcome given by Novus Ordo churches. Sources that, when taken together, are, by Catholic standards, magisterial in their authority. They are a sign of what attitude the church has and what faith and morals it consistently seeks to teach.
And so, we are now able to compare the magisterial teaching of the two churches. If we distinguish the two magisteriums as Catholic and Novus Ordo, we find that, according to Catholic teaching, the Catholic Church is uniquely true and a means to salvation. Other religions are to be condemned. The worship of other religions is false. Islam is false, abominable, diabolical, and has wicked morals. And we might add that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Trinity. Now, if we compare that to the Novus Ordo teaching, we find that other churches are part of the scheme of salvation. Other religions are to be praised. The worship of other religions is true. Islam is worthy of esteem and regards the moral life. And we might add that Allah is the same as God, despite the fact that Allah is not the Blessed Trinity. Thus, if we compare these two bodies of teaching, these two magisteriums, we see that one is not consistent with the other. In fact, the one is simply not compatible with the other. Having established that the Catholic Church must be consistent, it is clear that we must conclude that only one of these magisteriums is genuinely Catholic, and hence, as a result, that only one of these two churches can in fact be the Catholic Church. Continuing with the proofs for Sedivacantism, let us proceed with the respective doctrines concerning prayer and sacraments for non-Catholics. Once again, let's begin with the traditional, infallible magisterium. As was already mentioned, we have the teaching of Pope Gregory XVI. Therefore, they must instruct them in the true worship of God, which is unique to the Catholic religion. And Pope St. Gregory the Great, the Holy Universal Church teaches that it is not possible to worship God truly, except in her. Upon this, Canon Law 1258 states, It is not licit for the faithful by any manner to assist actively or to have part in the sacred rites of non-Catholics. It goes on to say, Passive or merely material presence can be tolerated for the sake of honour or civil office, for grave reason approved by the bishop in case of doubt, at the funerals, weddings and similar solemnities of non-Catholics, provided danger of perversion and scandal is absent. And so, canon law, which, recall, is based upon God's law, states that it is unlawful to take part in non-Catholic worship. At most, one can be merely present at non-Catholic ritual without participation. According to the Third Council of Constantinople, if any ecclesiastic or layman should go into the meeting house of the heretics to join in prayer with them, let them be deposed and deprived of communion. If any bishop or priest or deacon shall join in prayer with heretics, let him be suspended from communion. According to the Council of Laodicea, no one shall pray in common with heretics and schismatics. It is not permitted to heretics to enter the house of God while they continue in heresy. And according to Pope Pius XI, this apostolic see has never allowed its subjects to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics. Once again, we see the teaching that the Catholic Church is unique in its truth and ability to offer worship to God, and upon this we see clear and consistent teaching that worship with non-Catholics is to be diligently avoided. Neither is a Catholic to worship in a non-Catholic Church, nor is the worship of other religions to be brought into a Catholic Church. Now we can compare this to the Novus Ordo teaching. In one of the Second Vatican Council documents, we read, In certain special circumstances, such as in prayer services for unity and during ecumenical gatherings, it is allowable, indeed desirable, that Catholics should join in prayer with their separated brethren, i.e. non-Catholics. As for common worship, however, it may not be regarded as a means to be used indiscriminately for restoration of unity amongst Christians. 
Such worship depends chiefly on two principles. It should signify the unity of the church, it should provide a sharing in the means of grace. The fact that it should signify unity generally rules out common worship, yet the gaining of a needed grace sometimes commends it. Hence we see permission given for shared worship with non-Catholics which goes beyond grave reason outlined by canon law. Notice, therefore, that although this passage appears to be conservative and does not recommend indiscriminate prayer, it is still permissible in a way that the prior teaching was not. Simply put, there is a shift from never to sometimes. This might not seem like much of a distinction, but logically speaking, never and sometimes are simply not the same thing, and indeed are not compatible with each other. Use your logic and consider the insult done to God if we were to begin by saying that he is never evil, and then we said, in fact, he can be evil sometimes. To continue, John Paul II, speaking of prayer with non-Catholics, said, When we pray together, we do so with the longing that there may be one visible Church of God, a Church truly universal. John Paul II also promulgated a directory for the application of the principles and norms of ecumenism, in which we read that Catholics who attend non-Catholic churches are encouraged to take part in the psalms, responses, hymns, and common actions of the church in which they are guests. Francis, in a gathering with the Lutherans, said, With this joint statement we express joyful gratitude to God for this moment of common prayer in the Cathedral of Lund, as we begin the year commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And as we have already seen, non-Catholic worship has been allowed in Catholic churches. Yet, this is not limited to Muslim worship. Catholic bishops have joined with Protestants in worship. Both John Paul II and Francis have publicly taken part in pagan worship. And, following the Novus Ordo principles, a Novus Ordo diocese even gives explicit recommendations on how to behave when visiting non-Catholic churches. The laity are not instructed to be strictly passive, as canon law demands, but instructions are given on bowing to prayer books, giving gifts, and showing respect to pagan deities. Therefore, we see consistent assent given to the idea that worship with non-Catholics is permissible, if not encouraged. Finally, we come to the issue of the sacraments. Here are some instances of traditional Catholic teaching. According to Pope Gregory XVI, whoever dares depart from the unity of Peter might understand that he no longer shares in the divine mystery. Whoever eats the Eucharist outside of this house is unholy. According to Pope Pius IX, whoever eats the Eucharist and is not a member of the church has profaned. And according to Canon Law 731, it is forbidden that the sacraments of the church be ministered to heretics and schismatics even if they ask for them and are in good faith, unless beforehand, rejecting their errors, they are reconciled with the Church. Now, according to the Catechism of the Novus Ordo Church, Catholic ministers may give the sacraments of Eucharist, penance, and anointing of the sick to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church. And according to the new Code of Canon Law, Canon 844. Whenever necessity requires it, or true spiritual advantage suggests it, and provided that danger of error or of indifferentism is avoided, the Christian faithful for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister are permitted to receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick from non-Catholic ministers in whose churches these sacraments are valid. Hence, once again, we see the shift from never to sometimes. Even if the shift seems slight and conservative, we see in the magisterial teaching of the Novus Ordo Church that the administering of the sacraments to non-Catholics 
is permitted in a way that it simply was not in the past. In sum, we are again able to compare the magisterial teaching of the two churches. If, again, we distinguish the two magisteriums as Catholic and Novus Ordo, we find that, according to Catholic teaching, Catholics are not to pray with non-Catholics. Non-Catholic worship is not permitted in Catholic churches, nor should Catholics participate in non-Catholic churches. Non-Catholics are not to receive the sacraments. Now, if we compare that to Novus Ordo teaching, we find that Catholics can, and sometimes should, pray with non-Catholics. Non-Catholic worship is permitted in Catholic churches, and Catholics can participate in non-Catholic churches. And, non-Catholics are permitted to receive the sacraments. Thus, if we compare these two magisteriums, we see that one is not consistent with the other. Therefore, it is clear that we must conclude that only one of these magisteriums is genuinely Catholic, and hence that only one of these two churches can in fact be the Catholic Church. Proofs for Sedivacantism have been presented. More proofs could have been given, but were overlooked for the sake of brevity. If we continue with the evidence that is given, we can zoom out and see the bigger picture. We have seen details of how the traditional Catholic teaching on other religions and non-Catholic prayer is inconsistent with the Novus Ordo teaching. But if we take this general cluster of arguments, we see a general principle. The Catholic Church has always seen itself as distinct, unique, pure, and decisively superior to all other religions, which are either false outright, or, at best, lies, perversions, and distortions of this one pure truth. And of course, this stands to reason if the Catholic Church really is the one true Church of God established by Jesus Christ. With the softening of the distinction between Catholicism and other religions, the Novus Ordo doctrines effectively blur the line between Catholicism and other religions. That is, blurs the line between what is true and what is false. Yet, if Catholicism is true, it cannot have its truth diluted in this way. Again, its magisterium is consistent, infallible, eternal, protected by the very spirit of truth himself. Hence, any doctrine or church or magisterium that contradicts and denies it is separated from, rejected, and removed by it as an automatic effect. The evidence shows that the Novus Ordo Church does just this. This all leads to the conclusion, if Catholicism is true, Sedivacantism must be true. Let us recap the argument. Sedivacantism is the theological position that the chair of St. Peter is currently vacant, and that the current claimant to the chair is illegitimate, as have the claimants been since the Second Vatican Council. By extension, the church that these false claimants preside over, and its hierarchy, are also illegitimate. Hence, a distinction is made between two churches, the Catholic Church itself, and the Novus Ordo Church, which has broken away from it. The Sedi Vacantis case is built upon principles of unity, consistency, and infallibility. It keeps to the Catholic principles that the Church remains unified in its faith, that her teaching on faith and morals cannot be contradicted, and that we find her infallible teachings expressed through her ordinary and extraordinary magisterium. Hence, without focusing on whether any given individual is a heretic, we proceed with the principle that a church which teaches contrary to the Catholic magisterium must be separate and distinct from her. Sedivacantism does not rely on private judgment because it is the law and the magisterium that judge, where Sedivacantists simply recognise and obey. Sedivacantism does not render the church invisible because those Catholics who hold the Sedivacantist position make themselves known as Catholics, and Sedivacantism does not entail a defection of the church because, if it is true, it still retains her faithful clergy and the power to appoint a new pope. 
Upon these principles, we examined the proof. First, we compared the respective teachings on non-Catholic religions from the Catholic and Novus Ordo churches. We found that the church has traditionally taught that the Catholic church is uniquely true and a means to salvation, other religions are to be condemned, the worship of other religions is false, and that Islam is false, abominable, diabolical, and has wicked morals, whereas the Novus Ordo Church has taught the opposite. We then compared the respective teachings on non-Catholic worship. We found that the Church has traditionally taught that Catholics are not to pray with non-Catholics, non-Catholic worship is not permitted in Catholic churches, nor should Catholics participate in non-Catholic churches, and non-Catholics are not to receive the sacraments whereas the Novus Ordo Church has taught the opposite. Therefore, we find proof that there are two distinct and incompatible bodies of teaching, two distinct and incompatible magisteriums. With all that this entails, it means that one magisterium is formed and taught by a true church, the true church, the Catholic church, and as such the other magisterium is formed and taught by a false church, the Novus Ordo Church, which simply isn't Catholic. Of course, there is always more to say. Indeed, we could have started by discussing the empty pews, the various perverted scandals, the ridiculous and irreverent masses, and so many other fruits by which we come to know the character of this modern church, which calls itself Catholic. But here we have confined ourselves to doctrine, and even then, only in a limited measure. Again, the hope is to work in the spirit of St. Bernadette, not to convince, but only to inform. Many questions will remain, but the hope is that at least some have been answered, and that, whether you agree or not, you now have a clearer understanding of this issue, which so presses upon our time. Thank you, and God bless you all.